Okay, so uh, this is our final meeting for the Efficient R Book Club. Um, and we have with us uh, one of the authors, Colin Gillespie. So welcome to the club, Colin. Thank you very much for being here. Um, so we have uh, like a, a handful of questions to start with. And, you know, I wanted to welcome you to ask us questions. Um, and then we'll just kind of, you know, it's a small group. So I want us to kind of have a conversation. Um, so to, to just to get things kind of kicked off, um, I asked in the channel, is there anything like, what comes to mind as something you would change or add if you were writing this today? So if I, I don't want to jump in too well. I'm going to jump in by saying I don't want. Yeah. So I've got a few slides where I basically thought of things that have not aged well, things that have aged well, <laughs> and things that just weren't around, and so you can't blame me. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if, if you want, you know, it's not a lot, and it's more just to sort of six bullet points just to sort of do that, because it's just sort of covered, you know, going through the, when I was listening to some of the videos going back, that yeah. you know, some things aged really well, and other things were just <laughs> like, was that a thing back then? Uh, yeah. It was it was interesting to kind of go look and see um, through the like our release notes of oh yeah like that totally changed since the book came out yeah so <laughs> uh, so yeah I said don't have yeah, much yeah. but I thought that might help <laughs> yeah I help me just that's great. jump in and and shout at me <laughs> uh, so uh, when you did this I I now feel particularly <laughs> old. Uh, just because I kept thinking, well, back in the day, you know, that's how you did things, and I was cutting edge. You, and now it's just like, I don't need to does that anymore? So I, I now feel particularly old. So thanks a lot for that. That was very nice of you all. Uh, and I think, you know, so for me and Robin wrote the book, it was never meant to be super technical. It was never meant to be this sort of eking out the nanoseconds. And so some people were always a little bit upset of not being able to do that. And I was just thought it was meant to be a collection of tips that I just sort of picked up over the two decades and I just thought if you wanted to go faster than you see you know that was just you know if you're really that worried just don't use R you know if that's if you're bothered and I think that's still the same today you know if you're really bothered about those extra bits of speed then probably not using R is still a, a relatively useful default position you know there's ways of speeding it up but yeah <laughs> uh, then I was an academic I used R for 15 years I did t lots of teaching in R and did a little bit of consultancy and now started jumping rivers, <laughs> used R for 23 years. We've done lots of consultancy and lots of teaching. So my perspective has changed from that sort of academic. And so again, even sort of seven, eight years ago, you know, people were using R in the companies. It wasn't what it is now. You know, it was sort of one or two people. <laughs> and I think when I, I remember teaching a course, this is the UK, so I taught a course yeah. introduction to R around about 2015, 2016. And we had around about sort of 50 people come to that from around the UK and around Europe, you know, <laughs> so they all came up. And then two years later, I had sort of four or five at the same course. But what had happened was we were now going into businesses to teach groups of people. So 14, 15, it was, I'm sort of trying to get my team and I'm the only person in my organization <laughs> using R. So I'm going off to learn about R. And only a few years later, it was, we have a group of data scientists and they're wanting to use R. And that, that's still the same, you know, so our public courses get relatively little people coming, but we're doing lots of going along for, for companies, uh, which is sort of interesting and good <laughs> if you like to use R. So some things aged well, some things haven't, and some things went around then. That's sort of how I structured this. Again, please jump in. Yeah. So actually, I might, what do you think's aged well? <laughs> I, I, I know I'm asking for trouble here. This, this could be right. really bad. I need to get the table of contents up so that I can. Uh, I thought it's too awkward, then I can just go. Yeah. Over. Well, I, I think like there were things in every chapter that aged well. And then, you know, there were definitely things in a lot of chapters that, um, you know, I guess the more specific it was, the less it aged well. Yep. Um, completely agree. Yeah. So the, the things that are all about, you know, like the learning section, yeah, some of it is you know, like ask on the mailing list or things like that, that aren't as, uh, I mean, it still can happen, but you know, there are other options. Um, yep. But the, the, when it's like, you know, uh, don't be afraid to ask or things like that, like, yeah, that, that age as well. So 
I, I think that's the general answer. I don't know if anyone else has any specific examples they want to pull up. Yeah, but, uh, data input outputs, um, things are clearly evolving quite rapidly, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, when I was thinking about that, sort of anything that was base R is sort of still applicable right. and true. Uh, mostly. So, you know, <laughs> mostly. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember who said, oh, invisible, they'd come across invisible. Uh, you know, that stuff still use that. In fact, it's still really important. And, uh, you know, anything sort of base R still just works and still gives you the same answer as Israel. The tidyverse, sort <laughs> of. Uh, so there's a lot of swearing in this book because the tidyverse kept on breaking it. You know, so when we built the book, we were one of the first people to sort of have this sort of get workflow that then published it to some sort of page and then you'd you know you'd probably put things in getting and it would be published you know that wasn't the done thing now that's just like you know everybody's doing it you know high school kids seem to be doing it now but when we did it that was quite novel <laughs> and the tidyverse broke all the time you know it was a pain in the rear end especially when you're trying to publish a silly book on it you know so they would have a function that would change or something that would be deprecated so <laughs> That's to say, you know, so was, I need to archive the, the repo because I really don't want to update pages on the tidyverse or because something's changed, you know, it's just, it's changed. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's something to bear in mind because it's still true to a certain extent. I don't want to go down a whole sort of tidyverse versus something else because I use it all the time. But it did sort of hit home of something that I just <laughs> wanted to publish and then just work forever more without thinking about it. You know, just wanted that sort of, it's done, yeah. right, move on, without having to sort of constantly go back and tweak it all the time, <laughs> and that did happen. Uh, yeah. I think that the general setup's aged well. You know, people are sort of doing that, get workflow, get deployment, so that's sort of been there. Uh, data table and RCPP, to be honest, I don't really <laughs> use them, but they're still really popular and they're still around, but I've never really used them. Uh, things that have not aged well, uh, there was a section of the book about different mm -hmm. types of R, and I, I think I watched the, the video, and there was just <laughs> amusement on people talking about it. It's like, what if this was a thing? <laughs> so again, sort of seven, eight years ago, people were thinking about building different interpreters for R, and, you know, you could substitute in one version of R for another version of R, and it would go faster. And yeah. I think the belief was actually at some point someone might have released a paid version of R, so you might have been able to get a paid version mm -hmm. of R. And you might remember there's a company called Revolution R. That's probably yep. before some people. Yep. So <laughs> Revolution R were then snapped up by Microsoft. Okay. And so they did have sort of a special version of R. <laughs> uh, byte compiling. I spent a hell of a long time trying to understand that. And then just before the book was published, they just said, oh, yeah, it's just going to be part of R. So I spent a long time understanding that. And then it was just part of R. And Travis, the way we deployed, it's now GitHub Actions. So no one really uses Travis anymore. Uh, it's not aged well. The project management chapter was a little naive for the, the book, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, don't use R for this. Use something like Asana or Trello would be my my advice now. But, yeah. uh, new to this decade, so CI, CD, uh, that's not quite true. It was there, but it's now sort of much more ubiquitous. You know, it's everywhere. Everybody's always doing continuous integration. Everybody's always doing... So if you don't know what that is, definitely go and learn about that that's basically where you <laughs> push to get and then it magic happens and it's something else so that's you know that's much more routine uh and if you don't know it's uh continuous integration continuous deployment are what the yeah. letters stand for yep sorry and so continuous <laughs> integration would be maybe you push some you've, you've got an r package you make a change on get and continuous integration would make sure you've not done something silly and that would <laughs> tell you if it's where it's continuous deployment might then take that package and push it to a repository. You know, that'd be an idea of continuous deployment. And that's much better than R now. This slightly better tooling. Yeah, I thought about that one. And for older people, you know, you, you, you don't know how <laughs> you're good you've got it. Uh, you know, so when R Studio came along before that, Emacs was the best you could hope for. You know, and you really had no other choice than Emacs or Vim. And if you don't know what that is, it's you can amuse yourself this weekend and get to the delights of Emacs and VI. Uh, but once R Studio, compared to what R Studio 
there is now the IDE to what it does seven or eight years ago. There's not a massive difference. It's, it's better, you know, it's got, got other things. But compared to not having R Studio to having R Studio, yeah. you know, that's like a step. And then after that, it's been sort of as a gradual iteration, you know, so it's definitely improvements. And, you know, things like, you know, colored brackets are definitely nicer, but we wouldn't say that's a, an amazing feature, you know, it's, it's just better, right. you know, the <laughs> debugging's better, but not, not that step change. I think Quarto is going to be help. So our mark then was, was just getting started and it was getting a bit messy and Quarto should do that. And again, better get workflows, which links into CICD. Uh, new this decade, RENV, things like Docker, you know, not mentioned in the book because it didn't exist. You know, that's sort of reproducibility. <laughs> Again, I think sort of seven, eight years ago, the idea of reproducibility is if you put it in Git, you're good. You know, that's it. <laughs> you don't, you know, your reproducibility is sorted because it's in Git, you're all good. Uh, that is not quite the case. <laughs> and part of the packages change. What's not been solved or what people don't really think of would be you've got your shiny app and, and as a company we come across this is they're using RENV, and so the Shiny app is completely reproducible, but it also means they're stuck with technology from four years ago. And so they've now got a whole host of out of date R scripts, out of date R packages, potentially dodgy JavaScript libraries kicking about, but it works and it's completely reproducible, other, other than being perhaps vulnerable and not very good. <laughs> uh, and so that, I don't think there's particularly many people talking about how do you keep that. You know, up to date. Yeah. You know, it's more like this will solve all problems. It solves one, but you, it creates another one that's just you've pushed it yeah. down the road. <laughs> uh, and likewise with Docker. You know, Docker is good, but it's it's tricky. You know, it, it's it's not it's not hard, but you don't want to teach it to everyone. You know, you just want it to be sort of yeah. happening. So that's all I've got. <laughs> uh, hopefully, that's happy for questions, comments, discussions, yep. anything like that. That was that was great. I, I didn't like uh, expect you to put something together, so I, that was really nice to see. Um, so I guess the the kind of baseline question, and you uh, you didn't say no at the start. Of is do you have any plans for a second edition? We did, and then life got in the way. Uh, <laughs> so. I yeah, it's finding time. You know, I, I might yeah. try and you know, it's always in the, it's always in my my Asana task board, my Trello board is update, <laughs> but there's it just take too long. So post probably not in the near future. Right. Uh, I do. It find, is you one. Know, oh. When you go, sorry. Just it, it's it's the kind of thing where at this point writing it, it's not like you change a few things. It's all you know. Probably a, a fairly large restructure of the book would be in store. So yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, not quite a rewrite, but not seventy-five <laughs> percent, probably to sixty percent, might be have to be. Yeah, redone. Which totally is, yeah. understandable. Um, uh, let's see, Floris had a couple questions. Do you want to ask him, or do you want me to ask him? Yeah, I can ask them, um, but perhaps first something about the RENV and Docker uh, uh, thing. Um, because I think the, the problem or the, the challenge for RENV is um, the contexts around R uh, when it needs uh, external applications or libraries. And R packages use that, and uh, you also need to freeze all those uh, isn't docker then enough solution doc so they're, they're solving two slightly but overlapping problems so rm so i suppose so so if i can re rephrase your question just to make sure i've got it right and if i've got it wrong then correct me you essentially got you've got a whole bunch of dependencies over here which are our packages moving up and down and changing and breaking and then you've got the system libraries that some but not all R packages would depend on. So in, in my experience, it tends to be the R authors that break things and not the system <laughs> libraries that break things. You know, so that you know, so if you've got a a package that does some regular expression that depends on some C library, my guess is that the R author might break that or might change something in that package that breaks things far more times than the 
to underline C library. Now that's clearly not always the case. So, you know, so if I was to sort of structure these problems, you know, problem number one is, can I just get my code from last year? Well, that sort of get, would hopefully take care of that. Problem number two is, can I reproduce the R libraries or R packages to a reasonable extent? And that's RENV. And then problem number three would be, if I'm really pedantic, can I completely reproduce the entire environment down to the operating system? And that would be Docker. So yes, you know, Docker plus RENV plus Git would give you that perfect solution. And it's sort of how far down that sort of tree of pain do you want to go uh, yeah. in terms of reproducibility? Well, that's, that's my, my, my experience in working with sort of different companies. Yeah, in the geospatial world, we have been seeing uh, a lot of developments in uh, the external GDAL and Proch uh, libraries. Um, uh, oh, yeah. spatial is a pain in the rear end. Yeah. Yeah. So, so those ones do change, and those, you're always at the cutting edge or the bleeding edge of Ubuntu. And so then, yeah, so Docker then starts to make sense. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps uh, related to that uh, was my question. Yeah, I had, had posted some on the Slack community, but only uh, half an hour or so ago um, uh, about um, the fact that our packages, some our packages indeed uh, bind to external C libraries. Um, I think in the book, if I remember well, and also in advanced R, uh, it is more about rewriting R functions in uh, C++ and how to do that or where to find more information about it. Uh, I was just interested about um, where to start with um, Binding to external C libraries, so not uh, necessarily writing uh, C functions yourself. Yep. Uh, that's a little, so I've never really done that in anger. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Dirk, the author of RCPP, he, he wrote a book in RCPP many years ago. It's quite detailed. I, sus uh, well, I know that the RCPP documentation is quite thorough. So that'd be the best place to start, but I couldn't say, oh, you should go and do that. You know, that's probably find. So there's quite a lot of RCPP packages out there. And I think some of them are relatively easy in terms of it essentially binds with a single C, C library and it's only got one or two function calls. You know, it's not binding to an entire suite. And that'd be the place I'll just sort of, if I was sort of interested as a, a little how to get started, I'd have a look at that just to see how that is structured. Uh, I'm looking at the other question, which is Arrow and that yep. sort of stuff. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that's, <laughs> I've played a little bit about with Arrow. I think it was also used to be called Feather. Uh, the other big thing that's going about is DuckDB. You know, that's sort of currently a, a big uh, sort of in memory type database. I think what I, I I think now we've got older I'm now always more on the side of caution in terms of where possible you know I'm, I always go for an R binary file uh, because it will work next year and always having that sort of in the back of your mind might might not be a bad thing now there's clearly situations where you need that and you know doing something with R binary doesn't work you know but I would always be more cautious now in terms of going outside just for that I just want I want things to work next year without <laughs> me having to think. You know, that's now getting more and more important to me as we've got, as we've sort of grown a company. Uh, but yeah, you know, that, that stuff looks really cool, especially for, for certain situations. And very nice between jumping between R and Python, as more data science teams have that sort of R Python interface. But uh, you would rather recommend staying with. Um, established standards like text formats, then uh... only where it's sensible and appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't want to sort of go. You know, there's a whole big sort of thing about dependencies and how many dependencies your your workflow should be. And I think, mm -hmm. as a general rule, having a few as few as dependencies as possible isn't a bad thing. 
but that's not to say you should always have as few as possible. You know, it's a bit, it's sort of, you know, some, you know, if you've only got a thousand lines, then use a CSV file or an R binary file. If you've got 10 million lines, then don't, you know, would be, you know, and, and where you make that choice is, might be variable. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. yeah, things like R are really cool and definitely, you know, we'll be using them in the future. Likewise with DocDB, you know, we'll be using that in the future. Um, is there anything other than, like, is DuckDB the thing you are kind of most interested in right now or is there something else that's kind of got your eye? As far as like a new thing to uh, to, to add to what you do? So we've not really used much of that in anger. Uh, you know, quite often the way we've, we we sort of offer our clients is that they've either got massive data, but really they don't need all that data when they're doing whatever they're doing. You know, so you've got a massive database, yeah. and you know, after thinking about it, you don't need it all. You just need you know a few columns, and that's all of a sudden you've gone down from massive to a bit annoying, and so it's it's all fine again. Uh, or we might think about having an intermediate step. You know, so some sort of caching step, and then that gets rid of that problem. Uh, but that's just been our use cases in terms of what we have, we've been doing for clients, which is definitely not to say that other people don't need these technologies. It's just that sort of way, the bits we've been in. Yeah, I would say um, I don't remember if you did. You know, it's been been a while that we've been going through the book, but the idea of um, avoiding premature. Um, Optimization, I think you did yep. talk in the, about that. Yeah. That, um, yeah, yeah. You quoted <laughs> the uh, the root of all evil is premature yep. optimization. Um, I think that's like that's one of the best things to learn. <laughs> you know, like just make it work, and then worry worry about optimizing because it it might not have to be fast. Like if you're running it once a week, eh, so it takes an hour. Who cares? Um, so yeah, I just, I, you know, that's just a comment really. <laughs> um, and I would say, I guess, if you ever do uh, work on it again, I think some of the like efficient learning, I can understand it feeling kind of like an add-on, but having that earlier seems like it would be good because as you're doing the rest of the book, having those tips, <laughs> you know, <laughs> is useful. Yeah. Um, okay. Again, just a comment. I think thinking back, you know, Stack Overflow was still relatively new then. You know, to say, <laughs> oh, you should use Stack Overflow, you know, it seems right. Seems almost silly now. You know, you know, if you've been programming for any length, you'd have used Stack Overflow to a certain extent. Uh, but yeah, then it was still relatively. <laughs> I made slides uh, last time um, for that chapter with uh, a whole bunch of extra resources and all oh, right yeah. I, I've, I've not i've watched maybe about two thirds of the videos but not all okay. of them it depends yeah. Sort of time we do. yeah i think but, as we went we started kind of like using the chapter as a guideline of what to talk about yeah. and then whoever was presenting would um you know go off so uh again that worked it, yep. there was always something in every chapter that i was like i didn't know that um little things like I never thought about that the that question mark and question mark question mark are actually functions that have documentation and have arguments that you know you can refine your search using help.search and help directly. Um, things like that. So it's still, you know, I will I I want to say, even though it's got some age to it, it was still very helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh I also wanted to add, beside the, the quote that uh, John mentioned, uh, I found it particularly interesting to have the distinction between algorithmic efficiency on the one hand and programmer productivity on the other, and actually to stress more the programmer productivity. It was interesting to know, to, to see it, the big picture. Yeah. Which is, yeah, I, I, that's sort of what we're going for in terms of there's a few sort of things don't do this in R because it's just slow and silly. But after you cover them, 
after that, your speed is sort of tiny. You know, don't grow a vector. <laughs> you know, once you're not growing a vector, after you know everything else is yeah, it's all. <laughs> You know, it gets a bit quicker. Uh, I suppose now you might think, you know, we might think about how to debug shiny apps, and you know, now speed yeah. is seconds now matter. You know, what took three seconds? Well, a shiny app that's a lifetime. Yeah. You know, so those sorts of things matter. Yeah, that that could be a whole book in itself. I think for debugging shiny. Um, I mean, I guess. And it somewhat is in that the uh, the think our um, uh, production grade shiny apps yep. book. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any other questions or comments for Colin? I had I had thoughts on efficient <laughs> hardware. So I've presented efficient hardware and brief background. I built my own computers and I like doing it, but <laughs> like nothing is really out of Date, but you got hit with the there have been new improvements in computing since the chapter so like now there's not just one kind of solid state drive and the kind you get can matter a lot and like same with hard drives there's different kinds of hard drives and the kind of hard drive can matter a lot and then I think maybe gearing it almost towards like if you're trying to build the best computer you can for your data science, here are some things to consider where if you're using like cloud compute, you don't really need anything crazy on your local machine. Whereas if you're doing it all locally, then here are some things you might want to look into if you're trying to do like heavy, like TensorFlow type stuff, you might want a graphics card or like if you're working with big memory or big, big data, then more RAM. Or like more cores, that kind of thing. But overall, okay. yeah, I liked it. It was like a nice. I wasn't the background on the what is a byte. I was. I had never heard about the argument about like the seven or eight bits. So that was that was a fun thing to learn about. Yeah, that that chapter came from a little bit of consultancy that I did the year before, where someone had phoned me up from from a large supermarket. And they wanted to optimize some sort of market market basket analysis, and you know we had an hour's conversation of how to convert it to C and lots of consultancy before I asked of how much RAM, and you know the solution to the problem was to spend fifty pound, go to the shop, buy RAM, and the problem would be fixed. You know it was just, and then also having doing courses with academics and academics, you know they have a budget and. Typically, if you can sort of say to your boss, I need a bigger computer and it's only going to cost a small amount of money, they probably just go, yeah, fine, on you go, don't really care. You know, what's $100? What's $200? Uh, so, yeah. I never really found much of a difference between the solid state and the, the spinning disk, so... Uh, I... Other than startup times, you know, startup times for a laptop is amazing, but other than just sort of processing time is different. So one of the things I mentioned was um, mechanical hard drives. They've now started doing shingled magnetic recording where they can overwrite things you've already written because the read track is narrower than the write track. But those drives in particular, if you're writing a large amount of data, will just slow to a crawl and i think i've actually discovered one of my drives in my server is one of those because i keep trying to write things to it and it'll write like two gigabytes out and then just crap out and write like bytes per second all right so yeah when i did this sort of experiments which was very crude i have to be honest if i had a laptop and a desktop and i just sort of swapped between them i wasn't doing gigabytes of data if it was sort of 100 meg maybe might have been the, the sort of and essentially our slowness overweighed any speed up in terms of that uh in terms of having a solid state drive the fact that it starts up in two seconds is far better for my programming efficiency because i can open the laptop and start work you know so you save 10 seconds of your day uh there and then but yeah no yeah. i have a look at that i've not looked at that for a while yeah. um Gus, I'm not sure if your uh, latest version of the slides have been pushed, actually. 
did they not? I'm not uh, sure. Uh, At least there were um, images inside, I think, and, and I don't see them online. Let me. Um, for for Colin, I have uh, in the meeting chat added the link, the URL to the slides that have been actually oh, used you. in the book lab because of, sometimes it's more efficient than uh, uh, watching all the videos. Yep. Thank you. No. Oh, and there it. are some uh, questions as well uh, in the chat. Some questions. Use of data. Yeah, so data reading using radar. Yeah, so we use radar uh, parquet. Is that the same as Arrow? I can never quite remember. Our parquet. They're uh, related. Yeah. Arrow writes out parquet files, yeah, but you don't have to use Arrow to write parquet files. You could write parquet files manually if you wanted, but it would sort of like defeat the point. Yeah, I, I think I even wrote a blog post in Parquet, Arrow and Feather because it just got, I find that a good way of trying to understand something is to write it down for someone else. Because uh, then all of a sudden, all the, the, the grey zones become very striking because you can't, you know, you need to be able to write it down. But yeah, uh, writing a book, I did actually start a book a few years ago and then it just never went anywhere. I started a, a book on sort of using or a cookbook and Git, because uh, we do a lot of Git here and I quite enjoy messing about with CI and CD. But then unfortunately we started a company and that just got far too ridiculously busy. Uh, so never quite progressed. But one day I'll try and finish that off. But that was that was more fun. Uh, yeah, I still, I think one bit I do regret was, or that I now think was wrong, was the bit, in, I think it was chapter two talking about our profile. And some of the examples I put in the R profile of here's things you could put in yours. And I did have that in R, my R profile. And then I did commit it to Git. And then colleagues did try to run the functions that weren't in Git because they're in my R profile. So I'm now much more strict about what should be there. Uh, but you live and learn. Oh, that reminds me, you had a, a thing in that chapter. I'm curious if you really did it or do it for that <laughs> long of were you like update packages in your R profile? I think I did, but then very quickly didn't. Or maybe that was Robin <laughs> that did that. Uh, As I it yeah. felt it seemed scary. Uh and you know it, like it would slow some things down, but I was curious if you know if you found it useful. So so I was like nope. <laughs> so I sort of do I don't do it automated. So I would update packages regularly. So essentially, you know, yeah. for what we do at Jumping Rivers, we've got a whole bunch of stuff we do at training. And the scary thing is they always have to be the, the bleeding edge of CRAN because if you come along, you're just going to install dplyr. You know, you're not wanting me to say, oh, you need to install dplyr from last year's version. You'd be rather upset. You know, you're wanting today. So we've got training notes that are always a bit scary because they always have to have that bleeding edge. Uh, and then we've got things of... Then the things that we care about, we use RENV. So that's how we, we treat that part. Uh, and so internally, we don't have particularly much that we need to sort of worry about in that sense. Uh, you know, we don't have that sort of production code that doesn't work. Uh, and also, we can break it in our laptop, but it's always in Git and it's always deployed using a CI CD. You know, so I could go and throw my laptop in the, the river just now. Uh, I'd be rather annoyed, but <laughs> everything's on Git and I'm never manually pushing anything. You know, so I never have a shiny app that I'm pressing deploy. I'm never right. doing an analysis that's not reproduced on Git using CI. So that so I do do it to a certain extent, but with a lot more caveats of, yeah, I don't do it quite like that. Yeah, we had some discussion on that, didn't we? Uh, about uh, often updating packages or uh, not updating them for a longer time. I think the, the preferences were a bit uh, varied. So I suppose for us, there's now sort of 25 people using R at Jumping Rivers on a regular basis. So the, I, we either all have the latest version as the default for when we're collaborating 
or we use something like RENV to force everyone to use certain versions. Really? So if we don't use RENV, then the only thing we can be agreed on is the latest version. Yeah. Uh, because especially about the automated update, I think uh, mm. I also rather prefer having it a bit supervised. But uh, nowadays <laughs> I use uh, the R to U, which of course is a uh, more recent, yep. uh, which is yeah very handy. And I think with CI, uh, what we what we now do with a lot of stuff is you know things like shiny applications. So we might have an internal shiny application for course questionnaires, for example. And every month that CI job is just in a scheduled job of, can we build that shiny app? Can we run all the tests using all the latest versions? Doesn't deploy it, right? You know, it's not there, you know, cause we don't want it to deploy, but it is going on in the background that, you know, the first of every month, any shiny apps, any R markdown documents, can we just use all the cutting edge stuff and can we build everything and does everything still pass? And if it, something fails and we get a little Slack message saying the shiny app is, is not, is looking a bit fishy. And so again, that's sort of taking out some of the the scariness of that. Yeah. Uh, lots of guardrails. It all, go, it all goes down to if it breaks, how much are you going to cry? You know, that's the sort of <laughs> big thing. Uh, About um, like roughly how much of the time are you using RN versus like trying to keep it up to date, basically. Oh. <laughs> Internally, we don't use RM particularly much. The one thing that we're using RM for is, so we've got an internal project. So. So if you asked me this last year, it would always be almost nothing, right? We'd just say, right, just keep everything up to date and we'll use CI to, to build it. And that's partly because if something broke today, it's not a big deal for any clients, right? You know, so all the stuff I'm talking about doesn't have, it's not client facing. And so that the yeah. sort of caveats of someone that's not, someone might be upset, but it's someone internal, not someone external. So that's, that's the first very, very big caveat of, you know, bothered. in the last year, we're doing a, a project, so we're using lots of markdown quarter documents and we're using RMF, but I'm trying to get it where you're using RMF and you don't know you're using RMF. And so quarter is this you know, wonderful thing, RMF is this wonderful thing, but now you've got a bunch of people who might be data engineers who don't really know R, they might, you know, they might know enough to dabble. They're wanting to update a markdown document and they just want this silly thing to work. Right, they just want the packages to be the same. They just want things to work. And so we've got a lot of internal projects almost done where essentially RMF is hidden completely behind the scenes. You know, it's, it's running, it updates when it has to update, it detects when, essentially the rules are, if, if an internal package is out of date, then we update that package. If it's something like dplyr, who cares? You know, it'll get updated at some point. You know, that's the sort of, the, the sort of big idea. But we're, we're wanting to make it completely hidden so that people don't need to understand about inits and statuses and everything else. So once that happens, then much more will be using that. But it'll be semi-updating, semi-automatically updating as well itself. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, I I am a big fan of uh, I don't know. It's I, I think of it as more the the package workflow instead of the project workflow. Of think of this thing is going to be building all the time. You want it to be to work when it's up to date, and you want to be alerted when it doesn't work. Versus yes. you want it to run the same no matter what. And so I I I don't RM that often. Um, just my personal uh, way of working. <laughs> Yeah, we've, yeah, so I suppose, you know, the thing that we're trying to do is, you know, you've got that nice website that you showed me about all the slides. How would you yep. use RM with that website? But everybody in this room doesn't know that you're using RM for the website. You know, that's the problem that we're trying to face. Yeah, you know, that's you, actually, you... that is a, um, 
a situation that I go back and forth on. Of we don't use RN for the book book club slides because the idea is if there's a new cohort, like they're going to be installing modern packages and they want to know that it breaks, probably. Um, mm. And so, like, I intentionally don't use RM on those, but man, my life would be so much easier if we did. Um, other than I'd have to teach everyone how to use RM. Um, That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's it's a struggle. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I found it much harder than I thought, you know. And <laughs> we essentially go down make files, you know, so the idea being that you take make and then it builds, but then it's got logic behind the scenes to. To use our info, not you know, it's a bit weird one, but it depends on your people's background. Yeah, do you work with um connect a lot? Yeah, or at all? Okay, yes, <laughs> yeah. I uh finally have a project or a contract where I am using connect, and it's like, oh, all this stuff that I've kind of worked around in the past that's that's why they're a business, I get it <laughs> so. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So we do a lot of, of connect stuff, you know, automatically deploying to connect and then and uh, the sorts of things are well actually you've got all these applications. So connect for people that don't know it's Posits Pro Product. You know, you deploy lots of dashboards. But now you've got a hundred dashboards on there. Are yeah. they all using the same versions of the packages? How do you you know you you've now got that you still got sort of similar problems just at a, a higher level. You know, you solve a whole bunch of problems, but you then Create another one, but that's progress. <laughs> Always. Uh, um, yeah. Is anyone going so, to the deposit conference? Yeah, I will be there. Yeah. Anyone uh, else? No. Uh, oh well. If it well, <laughs> please say hello, John. If, I will yeah. for sure. Uh, and just one more thing that uh, Shot asked: if there are any other books that you are writing or have written. Um, or if you want to throw in like any recommendations you have, um, yeah, that'd be great. So the last book, I'm not writing anything else just now. Uh, <laughs> the last book that I read, and it's not an R book, so it would be a tricky one for for the the club, is Five Lines of Code. So the general idea being that you shouldn't comment your code at all, which I quite mm. like. With this one or two exceptions right at the end, and yeah, so uh, you know the examples are in Java and JavaScript, you know, so you can sort of skirt around the, the, the details, but you know it's quite readable and it's not that expensive in terms of books. I don't know if it's online, you know, I'd bought a hard copy, but I found that really useful in terms of now working with a larger team when you're doing a code review. What does that mean? When I'm going back to my old code and think which idiot wrote that? Damn, it was me. Uh, why don't I understand <laughs> that? Uh, and it came from internal. I, I remember, you know, telling someone to, to remove comments. You know, we were having this discussion. It's like, you know, just please remove all the comments. And so, like, why am I removing the comment? It's well, your comment is exactly essentially tell me the same as a function name. And if it doesn't tell me the same as a function name, then change the function. You know, it's but it's making that a bit more formal. So I, I quite liked five right. lines of code. But again, it's not an R book. It's it's got different examples in it, but I find it really useful. Uh, with the idea being that no function should be more than five lines of code. Uh, which is, five lines is, that's extreme. Okay. Yeah. I, I've I've done the, you know, basically it needs to fit um, in the part of our studio that I have my code in so that I can see the whole thing all at once. And I've tried, mm -hmm. you know, tried to stick to that, but five lines, that's small. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that all the time, but it has made me more think of having the the standard, you know, now having a standard sort of function, you know, line one of almost all my functions now is check stuff, and it just takes all the stuff that you've passed and then just all the checking <laughs> and either raises an error or not. You know, whereas normally you'd have a whole bunch of if statements at the start, you know, you're just sort of offloading that. Yeah. And then, you know, you don't need to document that because it's blatantly obvious what it's doing. It's checking stuff, <laughs> you know. I was going to say basically what Colin just said, where my metric is if I can put it in a function where the function name can quickly describe what the function does, then it's short enough. So if it's do thing, get stuff, like 
from this then if i can say it in like the verb and in the action then then we're good yeah cool all right um uh, yeah and uh priyanka said that she heard that a function should ideally have seven lines so same idea i think i'm sure i don't know what ideal exactly is but um i get the idea and yeah how much does a I don't know. I, I had seen the, the arguments before about, you know, co comments are an anti-pattern, but if you have too many comments, then chances are, um, well, you probably have too many comments, I guess is the short way to say that, that, if, you know, it's that balance and keeping comments to just to explaining like what you were thinking, not how to do the thing. Um, like if you went down a road, it's like, hey, this could be way more efficient if I do this. And then you go, oh, wait, no, it doesn't work. That's the kind of comment I'd like to definitely include. Um, so, yep. okay. <laughs> yeah, typically when I write a comment explaining what a function does, I've just made a mess, if I'm perfectly honest. You know, it's, you, <laughs> I, know, unless, you know, except for that sort of rationale of I've done X because here's the reason. You know, it's, So that's essentially the last chapter of when you can break the rule and that's one of the rules you know that's one of the reasons why you break you know you're doing something a bit odd and there's a reason you know it's not just you, you didn't know and that's i'll sort of work around it where if i design my project as a package then i can use our oxygen to give like nice healthy descriptions of what each function does and like the role it plays in the overall project and then if i want to i can sort of give like description of like here's in broad strokes what this function is doing. And then in the actual function, I can just have like that one comment that says, I did this because for whatever reason, if you do it this other way, that makes sense, it breaks. Or yeah. like, here's why I did this one specific thing. So. I think uh, the other, I think also thinking about trade-offs, you know, of efficiency is quite interesting. You know, so just now, you know, when you think about shiny, you know, just now you've got Gollum and you've got Rhino. You know, so Gollum, you know, you put your shiny app in a package, mm -hmm. and that's wonderful because it's all in a nice package. You've got all these wonderful package stuff, but now it gets a bit weird because you're calling an app from its own package, and it all gets a bit messy and it's horrible. And then you've got <laughs> Rhino that goes, "Well, that's just messy. Let's do it this way." But then it tries to reinvent the wheel because it's not in a package, so it's got all that that stuff because you're not in a package. And there's a trade-off in both. It's not like oh, one's terrible and one's wonderful. It's well, actually. Yep. The different ways of trying to tackle a problem and they've both got positives and negatives and you know that, that to me is a sort of i quite like those sort of interesting problems i don't have an expert <laughs> any knowledge to say what you, what you should do so i'm going to refrain from that part <laughs> uh, but I, I like these sort of ideas of just thinking about yeah. there is not a, the best answer you must do this it's, um cool yeah, about, um, sometimes you you want to explain um, things why you did something uh, or perhaps you tried something or it uh, needs to be uh, done in another way you, you want to add some more explanation uh, sometimes i then use the git message body to uh, add more uh, elaborate uh, explanations why i made certain choices yeah. And I think, you know, even internally, we've, you know, so we've got a whole bunch of code base where we should have used something called submodules in Git, which if you Google it, it's just horrible, right? You know, it's the <laughs> perfect technical solution to a problem is to use something called Git submodules. If we use Git submodules, it means that we've got a massive onboarding for every single person to come in and they will screw up their Git repositories all the time. And so, you know, that was a you know, so we've done something that's, you know, inefficient in terms of that's not the best solution. But it means that people can just get started with a day job and it's not that bad, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's one of these sort of trade-offs of, you know, do you do this or do you do that? And and thinking about it. And if we were all proper computing scientists, we would do it properly and probably not use R, if we're all honest. You know, use I don't know, Scala or Python or whatever <laughs> the cool kids are. Uh, but because we need to analyze data, we've got that sort of programming's always 
almost almost a secondary aspect. We program all day, <laughs> but we don't often call ourselves programmers. You know, we, we call ourselves data scientists or, or something else often. All right. I think that might be um, all the questions. So again, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's even with the uh, the things that have uh, not aged perfectly, it it was very, very useful to go through this book. So thank you for the book. <laughs> it did make me feel old just when you're going through all this stuff and going, <laughs> what is this? It's like, oh, damn. <laughs> But there you go. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> At the same time, it is also the challenge to us to be a bit more critical because of the age of the book and think and look around. So that is uh, also right. useful. Yeah. yeah. And it's also the cost of Stack Overflow, you know, and old questions are, are rated highly. Google likes old things, you know, so. Before the R package book was was written, building an R package was absolutely impossible because all the Google loved old web pages. So you got things about how to build an R package in 2005, which was wrong. And that, oh, you don't know how you're living. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, yes, hope, thank you. Uh, all right. And I'm hoping to join one or two of the the. I think I'll try and do Torch. I've seen that's up. Uh, I probably can't yeah. commit to every single week. That's my, my problem. You know, it's aspirational. Well, that's, uh, yeah, we've tried to start making sure we have enough people that, you know, you'll always have at least two people <laughs> showing up every week. And that way you don't need everyone there every week. You don't need everyone, um, you know, you don't have one person presenting every week. So yeah. hopefully we will... Uh, Keep that going. And I, I think Torch, like I'm as soon as I can find some time, I definitely want to read that book. So I will be there with you. <laughs> yeah. Unless I have someone sort of shouting at me to read something, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. All right. Well, Thanks we'll a lot. see you around. Thanks, yeah. And if you ever Thank see you. me, then please say hello. Yeah. Thanks. I'll see you Bye. at Pause Account. <laughs> yes. Bye. Looking forward to it. Bye.